I'm Lauren Berliner. Um, are the curators of the festival, those of you who haven't come to our show about the festival, um, and with a colleague, Andrew Hall, here. Um, and is for a recent found footage work. Um, and we got an amazing, maybe 150 entries that we programmed. Um, actually, two shows, maybe about you know 25 films or something. And every year since, we've done one pro more and more submissions from all over the world. Exciting to get to see kind of the um, of you know different filmmakers' work, program material, both sound and um, you know, we basically include any work, form of creation, even if it also includes original footage. But there's a combination. So this year's program, I think, is really interesting. We've got um, two pieces by Celeste Victor, um, by Scott Stark. Um, we have a piece, and they'll come up for a Q and A. Um, notice that there's a real variety in terms of the kind of footage people are using, the kinds of equipment, um, and that's something that we would love to talk with you about for the Q and A with Soda Jerk, and then also with any questions about, um, you know, our to curation and and some of the best about going on and in appropriation. Um, I really wanted to thank um, Adrian Sugar on the show together, all the tech. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> Not here, who did the design work, or San Los Angeles Film Forum generally, um, Festival of Inappropriation, um, you know, Adam would never have gotten started, so this is um, a great opportunity for us. Uh, anything else we should add? Just uh, hold your, your seat. <laughs> <laughs> Talk oh. about the intermission. Oh, yeah, sorry. About, we do have a 10 minute intermission, just a short, um, it's a lot of attention to keep have a 10 minute break. So, when, I mean, you can leave the theater, but it'll just come back and show the rest of the film. So, just have a little bit of a break in between. So, it's a loop of shorts. Um, so, forward to you afterwards. So, thank you. Uh, Jamie Baron Cohen and Lauren Berliner. And then we're delighted to have with us the members of the filmmakers known as. Soda. Where'd they go? Soda. Soda 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 Um, I guess I want to start out by asking a question, um, and of course, uh, we want to make sure that, that any of you who have questions also have an opportunity to ask questions to Soda Jerk, or to us, to whomever. Um, I just couldn't help, when watching your film, uh, just wondering, well, you know what, let me ask you this first. How did you guys come together as a team? And how do you come? How do you come to your ideas collaboratively? Um, and why? Why appropriation? Those three. Those three. Those just three questions. Small questions. Yeah, just small <laughs> questions. First um, of all, how you came together? Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I have a, a, a good Genesis story. We've been um, thinking about that recently. We should get one. We should appropriate one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Dan. <laughs> Uh, we've been working together for about 12 years and, um, yeah, it's always been um, a, an appropriation practice that um, we've been interested in. Um, the parameters of our practice are that we work exclusively with um, found footage, um, so always working with sampled audio and visual material. Yeah, and I just think that there's something about working with material that already exists, like we think of it sort of as this sort of matrix of... Um, you know, historical time, and then, you know, everyone that's encountered that material has their own sort of resonances with it, and so it already comes embedded with with stuff, you know, in a way that uh, it doesn't happen if you create new material. Like, it already has this history and these emotions that are a bit embedded in it, and so I think that's sort of what's really interesting about it, maybe. Right. Can I ask you what drew you to Betty Davis and Joan Crawford? Yeah, I mean, we made this work for an exhibition um, in Australia in 2012, uh, which was a survey of <coughs> Australian female artists at the Gallery of Modern Art, um, inventively titled Contemporary Australia Women. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess for us it was really important, you know, to be in the show, not just to be women, which we sort of already are, but to um, make work that sort of um, engaged um, you know, gender discourses. Um, and at that time, um, we had been making this body of work called The Dark Matter Cycle since 2005, um, where we create these um, sort of what we call like seance fictions where um, characters, well, deceased screen stars um, encounter these past and present um, versions of themselves. Um, and so for this e exhibition, we were particularly interested in sort of discourses like 
gender discourses of ageing, um, and of course Betty Davis and Joan Crawford were so, so sort of like famously fierce, um, you know, sort of women in Hollywood, and you know, Betty Davis saying like, you know, ageing isn't for sissies, and um, yeah, so I think in particular for us it was important um, that it be sort of like a dual portrait of both of those. Um, but they, they never encounter each other, but sort of just inhabit their own screen spaces. Uh, when you find your footage, do you go looking for it? Uh, and, and does it come to you and do you have <coughs> places where you go where you seek it out? Um, I mean, I think we voraciously watch a lot of film, and that's where it, it finds you or you find it. I'm not really sure which that is. Um, and yeah, there's no kind of, I, I think, parameters on where you might find something. And, you know, it might be historical archive or the archive might be, you know, the local rental video store or, or that kind of thing. So do, you, do you go looking for it with something in mind or do you just sort of filter whatever comes to you? Does it speak to you, the footage speak to you and then you get an idea or vice versa? Or? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think it's um, very improvisational. Like, I think that, um, and maybe that's something that I find that um, people that really like to work in this way, where you can't have a set idea, because if you're trying to find something, you'll never find mm -hmm. it. So you have to have an idea, but then also be very receptive, I think, is probably more important. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not sure that's and then also, depending on the project that we're working on, um, or the sort of concepts or, or whatever that we're exploring also determines the kind of material that we'll use. So sometimes it's very much sort of like um, uh, more celluloid or sometimes it's very important that it's digital. Um, mm -hmm. And we also kind of are interested in experimenting with how to materially um, uh, disrupt that, that materiality. Um, so in this work, um, we were sort of experimenting a little bit with like data moshing, um, which is how we got those sort of um, disruptions to the image. Um, but then in other works we've sort of experimented with like burning celluloid for a different kind of um, disruption. So yeah, that materiality and the source of it is, is sort of quite important. And, and are you currently focusing in an area now that, that is of interest to you? Or are you just open to sort of what comes to you now? Are you looking for, uh, are you focusing in, in a particular thing right now? Yeah, I mean, I think we work on a couple of different projects at the one time. I think that's really helpful and you can always find different things and they kind of cross-pollinate each other. Mm -hmm. um, um, so there's a couple of projects that we're working on and um, I guess one of them is about the sort of anti-heroes of the internet and sort of very interested in looking at 90s um, films that use the internet net, net exploitation flicks, I think. <laughs> <laughs> There are other questions from the audience? How did you come up with your name, Soda <laughs> I think that's more of an origin story that we don't have. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think we're just quite interested in um, being not not really anonymous because, you know, we're here and whatever, but, um, but there to be a little bit of an abstraction about, you know, whether there's ten of us or whether there's we're men or women or I don't know so for it was always kind of really obvious to us that we would take a found term and uh, you know um, yeah and then <laughs> appropriate it and appropriate it and just just run with it I think we read it in like a Burroughs book I think it was in like on the 12th page of Junkie or something <laughs> yeah and in an Australian context it means nothing so we like it even more <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about your use of split screen in this story? And why you made that choice? Yeah, um, that's actually um, that's quite a pragmatic decision in this because um, it's actually uh, was conceived as a two channel video installation. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is kind of just trying to represent the work as a single screen, um, but in its uh, yeah, native form, it has to, and it's in a loop, like so it loops back to the beginning and so even the kind of linearity of it to watch, you know, one channel and then the next channel would not usually happen in the gallery <coughs> because you'd be coming in at any time and then watching it until it completed round. Um, so I'm not sure 
how successful that is, you know, in terms of um, the, sp the split screen format compared to sort of when it has two screens side by side with their own spaces, I think that's probably but, but then on the other hand, you know, that I think, I mean, why we're suckers for cinema is because we love being a dedicated audience and I think could, that could also be said for when you make work for a cinema context um, or you sh have the opportunity to show work in that context, I, th I think it's such a privilege to have that dedicated audience and you, we don't have that in museums and galleries because, you know, people do sort of walk in and out and um, so I don't know, I always feel really grateful that, that you know, whole 12 minutes. <laughs> Was there sufficient alteration in the parts you appropriated to escape liability for copyright infringement? Uh, well, I, I doubt it. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, it's a really, it's a good question. Um, I mean, we're really, it, that's a very integral part of our practice, then, and we study the law um, as it pertains to sort of copyright and intellectual property. Um, and yeah, I mean, of course, in America, you have fair use and transformation um, is taken into consideration. Um, yes, there is like a lot of transformation, um, but it, that would be a matter for the courts to decide. Um, yeah, whether it would be you held under fair into, use. You haven't run into any problems. Um, no, I don't think we're, we're <laughs> really a threat to anyone. <laughs> I think you have to have money to be worth it. <laughs> Uh, we, we, we I was wondering if the curators could speak to the range of materials submitted this year um, and how that relates to previous years that you've seen and what changes you've watched happen. Well, I guess I've been around the longest. Um, I mean, I think there's more and more of a shift towards appropriating from digital sources. I mean, obviously, a number of the films are appropriating from sort of either Google image search or YouTube or, you know, other online sources. And we've had a little bit of that from the beginning, but I think it's become much more prevalent. Um, and then sort of sifting through what's actually interesting um, in terms of using those sources is perhaps a bit more of a challenge in certain ways, because um, there's a lot of stuff that's just like, hey, I found this neat thing on the internet, and that's not um, usually very interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and but there's still some people obviously working with film sources, and so I think we do gravitate towards including some of those pieces, particularly when, you know, it's interesting footage, like obviously Scott Stark is doing some really interesting work with, um, you know, archival film footage. Um, but in terms of other tendencies, can you think of anything? I mean, <laughs> Yeah, it's just the YouTube films. They're yeah. just there's so much more user generated content mm -hmm. out there to pull from that a, a project like Quarries, Bridges, and Dams wouldn't have been possible <laughs> um, at the beginning of the festival. Mm -hmm. So it's there, and we received more more submissions than ever, right? Like yeah. By far, um, and more um, from around the world as well. So. Mm -hmm. I think at the same time. Um, our general, our general approach is to, well, first have a, a, as wide a representation as possible of sort of, as Jamie mentioned earlier, the landscape of appropriation art right now. Um, and perhaps in some future avatar of the festival, there will be multiple days in larger venues with other types of, of appropriation art too. We'll see about that. <laughs> but um, I think also, I think it's pretty important to us that there's a there's a pretty strong concept mm -hmm. at work, even in the films that are made by the simplest of means through mashing up, um, you know, YouTube clips. Um, and I, I hope that came through in the program. Um, but certainly, uh, we're I mean, actually, we're very lucky to have two not only brilliant artists but um, very um, in articulate artists uh, <laughs> when they speak about their work, uh, because it's clear that there's a there's there's an engagement with the material that is very important to us. But there's also um, there's also a lot of thinking about about uh, the ideas uh, behind those behind those appropriations about the archive, about history, about the actual materiality of stuff. So. 
I think in terms of themes, though, also, um, some, like, last year, if anyone was here, um, we got a lot of really interesting uh, animation, you know, so we got either people appropriating animation or using animation techniques, and so that was kind of a theme last year. This year we had a lot of good split screen work. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's just certain tendencies that pop up, and it, it's sort of what we choose, but it's also, you know, we get a few good pieces and we notice a certain uh, commonality between them, but it's totally unexpected. Question here. Oh, sorry, is there one? oh, well, yeah, now I have two. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, working for 12 years in appropriation, do you have day jobs? How do you plans? <laughs> How does that work? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the life of crime definitely doesn't pay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, no, we don't sell our work or anything like that, obviously. Um, well, not necessarily, obviously. But um, we, yeah, I um, hustle. We've, we've been living overseas for uh, the last sort of four or five years and um, mainly kind of being uh, trying to do residencies and um, that kind of thing to um, have to realize as close to a full time studio practice as possible. Mm -hmm. And then we just live very, very hand to mouth. and. Um, but probably before that, when we were living in Australia, the reality of our lives there was very much that we taught at university and at the museum, and mm -hmm. we wrote um, the journals a lot more to support um, sort of what hours in the evening we could steal for studio practice. So and I think that's true of you know almost you know most creative professional like mm -hmm. I think uh, that that's just the deal that comes with it. You know, having to have multiple jobs and and trying to support yourself that way. I'm not just a preparation artist, I think. Okay. And, and for the curators, uh, what is your selection? Like, where do you call for entries? And how long, when do you start the process of selecting? How does it, do you eat, see everything together? Do you section it off? Or how does, what's your process? Well, it used to be that we were all in Southern California, <laughs> and then it was really easy. We just get together and watch them all together, and we did almost all see everything together. But this last year, I now live in Canada. Um, Lauren now lives in Seattle, so we've had to sort of find ways of watching things together. We're in pairs, um, so it's it's gotten more complicated. Um, but yeah, we do try to definitely all see everything. Um, although there's sort of a culling process, we get you know if we get over 200 entries. There are at least probably 150 that are not of great interest. <laughs> um, and so we have over 300 entries. This year. Over 300, yeah. So it's a it's a huge amount of, of watching. Um, so the kind of calling of like, is this at all interesting? We can kind of do individually. Um, but in terms of the schedule, uh, the festival used to be in the fall, and we've now moved it to February just because of scheduling. Um, but I think the new call for entries will go out within a month or so, and we'll probably program it over the summer, and then um, maybe it'll, it'll probably premiere again in February. So, And we send our call out to the frameworks list, to the film forum list. Um, if anyone has other suggestions for lists of people who <laughs> are appropriation <coughs> artists, um, we're trying to get more our call out further, I and mean, we obviously get a lot of submissions, but most of our submissions have been from the US, Canada, and Europe, and we'd really like to get more entries from other places. We've got a few from Asia, but not too many. And and while we're talking about global pull, I want to talk about global spread. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we do have a traveling show, so we, we are sending the show around. Um, so if you know of venues that are might, might be interested in programming um, the 2014 festival, um, you can check out our website, speak to us. Um, and we also have uh, DVD uh, sales, so we have um, going back five years of, of DVDs um, for purchase. So that was just a shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's, there's a big push. I, uh, this is for Sodiger. I was wondering about, I'm not that familiar with your overall work. Do you, do you always use Hollywood imagery? Or is, you know, because it seems like there's two schools sort of going on that I saw. And if so, why? Um, <laughs> no, I mean, like, what we uh, choose to use really depends on the um, projects that we're working on, and so they'll be quite sort of different in aesthetics and um, uh, different, like depending on the project, we draw on that material. Um, so 
So for one example, yeah, so we have these sort of fields of research. So this is sort of part of the dark matter cycle, which is sort of like one thing, but then, um, yeah, another kind of ongoing cycle that we have is um, one called um, Astro Black, which is sort of looking at like Afrofuturism um, and kind of the legacy of Sun Ra. And so that very much more draws on anything from lots of like NASA footage and um, music documentary and things like that. Um, and then... And then we're doing a project specifically around Australian sort of um, cinema and politics and, and so that obviously draws on that kind of body of work but you know I do think of Hollywood as a you know it's a global cinema culture in that sense it's very collective um, shared culture you know, and, we want to bring that. and I suppose also sometimes um, we have one project Hollywood Burn which is sort of an hour-long work specifically um, kind of it's almost like a I don't know a free culture manifesto or but it's just this sort of bombastic kind of um, Hollywood parody I guess about sort of pixel pirates versus Moses and his copyright commandments and it's sort of about you know uh, pirates fighting for piracy <laughs> um, and so of course in that sense it's 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 very deliberate that we we draw on, um, on on Hollywood material and we go even further than that and deliberately sort of un cast unwitting characters that are, are most going to be upset by being cast. So, you know, the Spielberg characters or Elvis is the main protagonist because the Elvis Foundation is particularly protective of his image, which is, of course, incredibly funny considering, you know, it's, it's he's the ultimate impersonator. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, so sometimes it is very deliberate. Once you've determined the works in a year's festival, how do you determine the sequence in which you show them? <laughs> That's a good question. That was the hardest part, actually. That is um, the hardest part. Yeah. Well, we actually um, have a brief conversation about it, and then we separately write out the order, and then we each make a case for the order that we've chosen. <laughs> and in the end, I think, in the years that we've done it together, the final list does not ever look like one person's particular list. So um, we, a, yeah, we think about pacing. We think about um, tone and and um, you know, what at what points people will experience um, different emotions. Um, we also, you know, this year we, we had split a couple of split screen um, pieces. So how, you know where to and Hollywood and where, where to put them in the program so that they complement each other. And certainly avoid, you know, showing too many films like uh, Magic Mirror Maze in a row because it can <laughs> induce seizure. Right. Um, or, you know, uh, too many films like Bloom or Charlotte Bagurek's, uh film because everybody would be maybe depressed after a while. <laughs> so, yeah, mixing levity with, um, with more intense things. And it's, I, I find it's the, it's the most fun part of programming this festival um, because it's really when we, we know which pieces are going to be in there and it's when we can really see the connections and why we love certain pieces and how they talk to each other. Um, and that's something that even with re-watching and re-watching the festival as a whole, um, new connections are drawn. So, um, really so you, you accept submissions throughout the year? Or? No, we have a call, um, like this year, I think it'll go out in March, and the deadline will be something like June or July, something like that. So there's a few months, basically, and then if you miss it, then it comes around again <laughs> next year. <laughs> yeah, Alex? Can you talk a little bit about um, the perspective of this kind of work, or theorization of work like this? There's an excellent book coming out by... Uh, Dr. Jamie Barron. Would <laughs> 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 you like to talk about that? Um, sure. <laughs> yeah, um, so I just wrote a book about, it's called The Archive Effect, uh, Found Footage and the Audiovisual Experience of History, and it's specifically about how archival footage has been used in documentary and experimental film to represent historical events and sort of reflect on historiography and how we understand the past. Um, so, you know, a lot of these films actually do speak to that. Um, you know, obviously, Passage, Gerald Ligurek's films, uh, Looking for Giro, 
Um, but, you know, I think in some ways all of them do, right? I think with any appropriation, there's some form of historicity because we're aware of the pastness of the footage, the fact that it served a different function in the past, even if it was fiction footage. Um, so, you know, that's, that's some of the work I've done. And then I'm actually working on a book that will um, hopefully probably be called Inappropriation because even though it kind of started as a joke, like, hey, that's funny, Inappropriation. Um, it's kind of a productive term. I like to think about the sort of inappropriate aspect of appropriation, that it's always a misuse in some way and that, you know, new things get generated that were obviously not intended by the original makers. And so um, that's something that I've been working on. And um, you guys also are working in various ways on appropriation. <laughs> not as directly. Not as directly. <laughs> It doesn't, there's not a, there's, it's not, there's not like a deep corpus of scholarship on appropriation, uh, to my mind, uh, it, at least in sort of moving image studies. Um, but, so there's a lot of terrain to, there's a lot of a terrain to sort of explore, it seems. Um, Why is it worth exploring? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it is, but please, what would you? What do I think? What, on the most basic level, what makes found footage worth having a festival about each year? I mean, probably just because it's happening. I mean, people are making this stuff, you know? And so, and I, I feel like having this festival, obviously there are some other found footage based festivals, but I think our festival does feel a kind of a, a niche that's a little different from like, hey, here's this cool VHS tape I found in the basement, you know, which is also fun. Um, but, you know, we're looking at sort of how mainly artists, I mean, there's some more amateur work, but it's mainly professional artists who we end up programming, I think, largely. Um, but, I mean, I think there's something about this moment in our culture, and obviously digital media has influenced it. Um, but people are doing this. They're taking stuff and doing stuff with it. And so just to try to figure out what it all means, I mean, I think that that's a worthy project just because it's happening. Yeah, I could think of three, three reasons why it's worth doing. One of, one, of the, one of them is the one that Jamie just talked about, the fact that actually it's being done. And so it's, um, it's worth paying attention to. I, I would imagine that, um, that, that you two could also, that Dominic and Den could also, talk about why it might be worth worth doing uh, from the artistic standpoint. But I think I think um, a lot of times we talk about how we're living in a post-historical moment, um, that history, that our very relationship to history is, is different now than it was even 10 or 15 years ago, precisely because it's um, happening so instantaneously. And actually, there's even uh, a desire among many people to make history simply by showing up um, and and being witness to things that are happening because that means that you might have some small part in making that thing happen um, and we'll know about it because somebody will film you um, very likely with their iPhone so um, so I think I think this idea of, of appropriation art uh, is very interested in the question of uh, history, its status, what a relationship to it is. Um, I think on a related note, the how we think about archives, like where do we store documents and things that um, we use to, to tell history. Uh, archives are changing. Um, our archives are changing because the nature of the materials in the archive are changing. Um, and the film archive in particular is one of the very problematic parts of that shift uh, because we're preserving less and less film and um, storing more, th more and more things in just digital format and that has all kinds of implications. Um, so those are a few reasons why I think it's real interesting. Oh, and also just, sorry, but just one more thing. In art history, it, when we talk about art, people talk, people say like, art history has ended. The history of art has ended. Some people say that, that like, it's all, we've, that the story that we told ourselves about the history of art, we can no longer tell ourselves because we've done it all. And so now everything is art, but how do we, how do we start thinking about art in a new, in a new way? And I think that has a lot to do with whether we invent, well, how we invent, 
how we invent things. And we have this whole sort of universe of materials, artistic materials that already exist. And appropriation is one of the ways that um, I think we're starting to talk differently about the future of art as well. So did Jerk, did you have any other thoughts to add on that question? And then we'll come back to all of you as well. But. I don't know, I thought that was pretty eloquent. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, I think we just want to express our gratitude as well. I mean, we like, have followed the festival and to see that program, it was just such a smart, um, mm -hmm. tightly curated program and the way the work spoke together was really, really exciting. And I mean, I think experimental film festivals are always like such a privilege to be part of because it's always like kind of a meeting of people that are into the same stuff as you, but this is like, Comrades, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really exciting. Yeah. In the front row. Yeah, I'm interested in the curators evoking the term art to describe these works. William Burroughs talks about storming the reality studio. The situationists and David Bors were against art. The Dadaists were against art. So why are you putting it back into a bourgeois mm -hmm. context of art? Because mm -hmm. doesn't that remove its radical political status? That's a good question. <laughs> And it's interesting because actually um, the Justin Lincoln piece, the second one, just called Statement, um, where he talks about what he does as research, um, in some ways actually is a term that's perhaps speaking to me. I mean, I do think of it as art because, I don't know, most of the people think of themselves as artists. But, um, but I actually like the idea of thinking of it as research in terms of, you know, appropriation as being this method of thinking through things and then putting it in a format that we can then you know, experience as a communication, but the, it's the research element that in some ways I think is the more provocative way of thinking about it. So we, should we not just ignore the language of art then and demand our own language? Perhaps. Perhaps, or perhaps, <laughs> perhaps, we can, perhaps, we can, perhaps we can give art the benefit of the doubt and think of art not so much as a bourgeois, as, as the province of, of some bourgeoisie that may not exist anymore anyway. And um, think about research as an art form. And one last question, perhaps, to wrap up the evening, or uh, anybody, or for any, of, for any other thoughts. We'll all be here to. Uh, they'll be here to take your one-on-one -on -one yes, inquiries we love, as well. We would love to hear your thoughts. So, if anyone wants to hang out afterwards and you know, talk with us about your thoughts about the films, we would love to hear it. And we would just really like. Thanks, Editor, for, for being here. Thanks for having us.